Well, now we're going to do the ulnar gutter splint, ulnar gutter splint, and perhaps for a boxer's fracture, if you believe in splinting boxer's fractures or uh, fractures of the fifth metacarpal or other fractures as well, mm -hmm. first thing let's do is measure how long we want our splint. Two finger widths below the mm -hmm. antecubital fossa. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to the very tip of your fingers. Tip of the finger. So mm -hmm. there is our measurement right there. I go a little bit longer. And you can use a ruler too or a tape mm -hmm. measure. Or I call it tape measure. All right, so there's how long our fiberglass is going to be. Let's go get some fiberglass. So this is going to be our padding, just to make it a little bit more comfortable. This is wet. This is webral. That's made to the same length as our splint is going to be. There's one, two, three, and four layers of webral. And that the fiberglass padding, that's a little thicker, it seems. It is. Would you put four layers of that as well? Yeah. All right. So what you can do is always uh, trim the edges. Trim so. the edges. I've noticed that when, you, when we put our splints on, you mm -hmm. have the edges trimmed to make... Now, that's, that's, uh, that's the artistry. I, uh, that's, uh, for, for our splinting 101, you don't always have to do that, but if you want to get the A-plus in your exam, there you go. Nice. And what's, what size, at least for my size of arm, what size of fiberglass are we going to be using? Um, I would typically use a three inch. Three, a three inch fiberglass. Yeah. And, and what is, is that, just, is that so that you're able to cover these fingers? Correct. Volar yep. and, and dorsal? Yes. Okay. Yes. So starting out, we've got so our padding. I have my padding. Glass. So here we go. It's, it's simple. You lay your measurement right on top of the fiberglass. Yep. Trimming the edges again. There we go. And every time Janelle's putting on a splint, she pulls a little bit of fiberglass out and trims the edge so that it's not going to irritate the skin. Again, you can slay it there. And that's where our padding is going to go. Mm -hmm. And the padding goes, and this not always intuitive, so you can see that this fiberglass is, ace, is the the pack casing is asymmetric. You've got a thin side and a thick side, and the thick side is what goes against your skin. And now here is extra padding to go against your skin as well. This thin, this thin side, that's what goes to the outside world. The owner gutter splint, is this, you have them lying on their back when you put it on? I, I do. Um, a lot of times it, it's just easy. All they have to do is just relax, rather than somebody trying to, you know, be gumby here and trying to move around. And when we did the thumb spike, I was sitting up. Do you, do you usually have them actually lying back for the thumb spike or, or not really matter so much? I actually usually have people just sit up for thumb spikes. Okay. So I had to uh, cut all these little socks for you. But look at this. Here, here comes a stockinette for our ulnar gutter splint. And this is a little bit more involved than the previous stockinette that we've seen. Um, it's a, actually the splint, in my mind, is a little bit more complex. And the stockinette is put on to protect the skin from have, getting irritation from sweat and from the material that the splint is made out of. So step number one is our little finger sock. Yep. So what I'd let you do is just kind of relax so your hand goes back, your wrist goes back a little bit. So you're just kind of hanging out. One over the pinky. Yep. A little sink finger sock over the pinky. This is a similar technique that's used for a lot of the little socks and sleeves. Is This is that finger sock that then keeps the skin from rubbing. And you can probably even make it a little bit longer. Right. Number two. So another stockinette. Stockinette. And this has a slice in it yep. about ha half of its length. Mm -hmm. The slit part goes over the ulnar aspect of the hand, and then the intact part goes over the fingers. Then 
then I made another sock for your whole arm. And thumb will go through the hole again. Sock number three. Thumb goes through this hole. Yep. And the arm is covered just about up to the elbow. And she's making sure that there's no creases, it looks like. Yep. Okay, so there we go. Hand is covered with a nice sock. We've got the part that's going to actually go for the ulnar gutter splint, the, the distal element. We've got our little sock right here over the pinky, and then the part that covers the arm. And this thumb hole, nice touch. Hey, it's Mac Beal, hand surgeon extraordinaire, is going to join us for putting Hi on there. the ulnar gutter splint, or ulnar gutter, I'm not sure which. Uh, ulnar gutter. Yeah. Ulnar gutter. Well, Mac, what uh, what are some of the key elements to a successful ulnar gutter before we even put the fiberglass on? Uh, well, there are a number of different ways to put a splint like that on, but one of the key things uh, that's hard to do with an injury, but the more you can do this, the better, is to get flexion at the MCP joints right in here. And the reason that you want to get that flexion is that the ligaments on either side of the joint called the collateral ligaments, when they're straight, they're relaxed. So if you leave them straight for a long time, they can scar down in that relaxed position. Then it's hard to get those fingers to bend again. Versus if you have the fingers bent there, then it keeps the ligaments on a stretch so they can't shorten up and tighten up. Now it's hard to do that when you've had an injury, but uh, to the degree you can get that bent down at the MCP joint, that's going to make a more successful splint. Let me ask you a question about that. Do, when, I, when I was doing orthopedics in residency, I remember mm -hmm. putting on uh, probably at a hundred ulnar gutter splints, and in rounds every day we'd look mm -hmm. at the x-rays, and we would have those splints like this, and then on mm -hmm. the x-rays <laughs> it would look like this. Yeah. So a common error there is when you're bending those fingers down once you get everything wrapped up, it's easy to be bending at that PIP joint and really not get much bend there. So one of the keys there is to actually really hold those PIP okay, joints show, extended. Show sure. So number one, you get uh, the elbow relaxed, you get the wrist back a little bit, you hold the PIP joints extended as you flex down. That way you know that you're not just bending through the PIP joints and leaving the MCP joints extended. So extending the PIP, flexing down there, and making sure, trying to make sure that when you do that, that you're not letting too much material bunch up in here. So when you flex down, you let that material slide out a bit. If it bunches up, that'll block you from getting bent down there as well. Does it matter how much flexion or extension you have at the wrist? Um, just from a comfort standpoint, the more flexed it is, the less comfortable it's going to be. So if you get your wrist into about 20 to 30 degrees of extension, that's normally going to be the most comfortable position, and it's going to make it easiest to get your fingers down as well, because it takes a little tension off the tendons there. All right, so we're starting up here at the fingers. That's our yeah. initial point of contact. So there are different ways of applying it. You can apply it just on the palm side if that's all you need. A lot of times it's good to have it on the side where you're folding over so that you can get support both on the back and the palm side. But again you want to try to get a little bit of extension through the wrist. A wrist a little extension. And then as you bring the fingers down you can hold those PIPs straight and you can use your thumb to kind of feel where you're flexing. Yeah, I'm feeling pressure there. right here. I'm feeling max thumb with pressure right over my MCP right there. So we'll get started rolling to support that. As with any splint, trying to avoid any major wrinkles in the splint. So Janelle we does a great job. We started that. right with the thumb opening. That was our anchor point. Went a few around the wrist, and now we're going to go over the fingers. Now this this uh, splint seems a little small, but we would we would want to go for the Janelle was saying the three the three incher for someone my size. Um, I I usually even like to use a little bit more. It uh, for someone your size 
uh, four inch splint might work a little better because then you can get a little better wrap over the ring finger as well. But it depends on whether you're just trying to immobilize that fifth finger or metacarpal or whether there's something going on with their ring as well. Now, I, now what I'm feeling right now is I, I, this is all just gently molded and I'm feeling the pressure here and over top that's keeping my keeping my fingers in that 90 degrees flex position. And what you're doing is you're trying to help me and you're tensing your wrist and your fingers so relax. there you relax and then all of a sudden your wrist extends to a more natural position and we can hold your fingers in a little bit better position to where they should be. So you can see a nice bend through there. And that's pretty much it. And we just hold it till it dries. And what do we what do we want to do at the end here? Do we want to expose the fingers? Well, it's nice to be able to have at least enough where you can see the tip of each finger so you can push in and check the capillary refill. But uh, yeah, it's, as you can, sometimes if you've got the little stockinette under there, you can fold it back and get the ace wrap over it. It'll make it a little cleaner looking. Nice. But that's aesthetics. Functionally, this will work just fine. So besides, besides these coming in, and I'm, I'm going to actually take the splint out of its nice position, okay. besides them coming in like this, yeah. which is the problem, and you want them like this, mm -hmm. like that, yeah. that's the ideal position. Do you see any other problems with this ulnar gutter splint? Um, Sometimes it depends on how you hold it. If you're really holding it hard as you're trying to mold it, you can create wrinkles. It'll put pressure somewhere like over the ulnar head. Or if you get this way and then you bring them into ulnar deviation, you'll create a big wrinkle here that'll cause some skin irritation. Um, but uh, the key thing is that MCP joint and just trying to get a, a smooth transition to the So I can feel my fingers are, are snug, but they're not overlapping. One thing that you want to check for after this splint, little extension at the wrist and then 90 degrees at that MCP joint. 